Hey, it's Rob here in Crazy Town, bringing you some bonus material while we're in between seasons. This is an episode of The Practical Stoic, an outstanding podcast hosted by Simon Drew. Simon interviews our very own Richard Heinberg, senior fellow here at the Post Carbon Institute. The title of the episode is Consumerism, Sustainability, and the Coming Corrections. I hope you enjoy it. Hi there. You're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today's guest, really fascinating, Richard Heinberg. Uh, So, Richard, uh, I first was reminded of his work when I was watching uh, the documentary The Planet of the Humans, executive produced by Michael Moore, and Richard is featured in this documentary. And he had so many interesting things to say. And I thought, man, it would be so good if I could get him on the podcast to have a conversation about, you know, a few of the predictions that he's made, for example, in his book, uh, The End of Growth, which was written, I believe, in 2011. Uh, And a lot of the things that we see today in our society, especially with, uh, you know, current economic movements around the world, environmental movements, uh, there's a lot going on. And he has a lot of really fascinating wisdom to give us. So, I'll tell you a little bit about Richard, and then we'll jump straight into the podcast. So, Richard Heinberg is Senior Fellow of the Post Carbon Institute and author of several books on energy and the environment, including Afterburn, Society Beyond Fossil Fuels, and with David Fridley, uh, Our Renewable Future. His upcoming book is called Power, Humanity's Quest for Ability, Control, Influence, and Beauty, and How It All Went Wrong. Quite a cliffhanger there. But uh, seriously, I can't say enough about this guest. He's he's such a wonderful guy, and I'm going to try and get him back as many times as possible. I know that he's busy, but uh, man, we want to get as much wisdom from this guy as possible. But uh, anyway... I hope you enjoy this episode. Check out the links to all of his books in the show notes. I'd love for you to go there and check those out. Uh, And without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Richard Heinberg. All right. So, Richard, uh, like I've just been saying, I'm so grateful to have you on. Um, You know, the the, the reason why I'll set set the whole scene here. The reason why I I decided to reach out to you is because I recently watched that documentary, obviously the planet of the humans, everybody's talking about it. It's made quite a splash in the global community. (laughs) And, you know, I think that there's, um, there's all kinds of mixed reports. You know, there's a lot of people who come out and, and, and say, well, you know, it's probably not as bad as what they're saying. There's a lot of people who come out and say, well, it's actually a lot worse than what they're saying. I think when I watched it, coming from more of a philosophical background, you know, obviously learning a lot about stoicism and philosophy and, um, I, I wasn't necessarily, uh, I, I understood that there was going to be a certain element of maybe sensationalism. There could be, um, and, and I was trying to be objective about it. But the thing that I really took from it is the Stoics taught us the philosophical argument for why we should probably curb our desires, why we probably shouldn't be so greedy, right? And why we should recognize that nature actually provides us everything we need if we're willing to actually be happy with what nature provides, right? And and just be happy with simplicity. And what that documentary really showed me was whether you agree with the political stance or not, we live in a world that is... uh, overcome with greed, overcome with desire for um, more, more, more. And so while philosophy offers us a the, the moral argument for why you would curb your desires, people like yourself and, and documentaries like this can show us the almost the scientific reason for why we should really pay attention to uh, curbing our desires. So I wanted to set the scene like that and and maybe let you jump in and, and give us a bit more of a background for 
what you've been bringing to the community, the global community lately. And, and since, you know, I know you wrote your book, The End of Growth in 2011, you've been seeing this stuff coming for ages. So right. where do you come into the discussion and what can you tell us about why we should be really curbing our desires? Ooh, well, there's so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I really got started with my thinking back in the 1970s after reading a book called The Limits to Growth. Mm. Um, I was 21 years old when that book came out, and it, it completely changed my whole worldview. I realized for the first time that the world was on an unsustainable path. But it, I didn't really fully understand why. It took me actually decades to, to really internalize and, and analyze what, what was going on. Uh, and by the 1990s, I was thinking specifically in terms of energy, because energy is what allows us to do anything that we do. With, we cannot, literally cannot do a thing without energy. Even if, uh, if we're a plant or an animal, we need energy in the form of, of sunlight or food, right? And we humans have been able to do so much because we, especially during the last 100 years or so, we've had access to uh, cheap concentrated energy in the form of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And that's enabled us to build the, the modern industrial world. Um, so having all of this cheap, abundant energy available to us enabled us to grow manufacturing, population, consumption. And then we, we constructed uh, our political, social, uh, and economic systems to support growth and to demand further growth. Mm. So whereas in previous societies, there were, there were checks and balances, there were uh, moral, ethical, religious systems that said, uh, you know, it's, it's good to be parsimonious and it's, it's good to not want too much and, and people who are greedy are going to hell and, you know, all, all of those sorts of things. Mm. All of that kind of fell away because we were, we were developing what came to be known as the consumer economy. Mm. And uh, consumerism is, is not just a, a, a kind of moral shortcoming where some people, you know, get caught up in going to shopping malls and so on. Consumerism was a carefully constructed system, uh, economic and social system, developed uh, starting in the 1930s in response to the problem of overproduction. Mm. Um, during the 1930s, the, we, had, we had started to use lots of, uh, especially in, in here in the U.S., lots of fossil fuels in the form of coal that w enabled uh, industrial production to uh, to proliferate, uh, we had more science engineering, you know, car makers were making more automobiles, uh, uh, farmers were using more tractors. This was resulting in, in, uh, fewer people being needed for farm work. So lots of people were gravitating to the cities. They needed mm -hmm. jobs. And, and so the whole social economic order was being disrupted pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. And one of the effects of that was the Great Depression. And one of the causes of the Great Depression was you know, too few people able to afford to buy as much stuff as we, was being produced. And meanwhile, needing jobs. So consumerism was a way of solving this problem. Hmm. The idea was with advertising, we would talk people into wanting more stuff. With consumer credit, we would make it easier for people to go into debt so they could buy stuff now and pay for it later. And even future generations would pay for it later because with more consumer credit, then that created more of a financial industry, all based on cl claims on future wealth. Mm. Uh, and more and more sophisticated claims as time went on up to you know subprime loans and derivatives of all kinds and, and so on. So uh, we, we also, at the same time, began tracking and measuring the economy as a thing. 
and it's it's hard to imagine now because you know we we talk about the the economy all the time it's just a commonplace mm. but this wasn't the case prior to the 1930s 40s and 50s um there was there was some effort to you know keep track of how many people were unemployed or something but very very uh, primitive efforts compared to what, what we're familiar with today. Hmm. Now we have GDP, we have uh, unemployment statistics that are syst- you know, systematically collected every month. Um, uh, interest rates managed by central banks. All of these things did not exist really prior to the time we're talking about. Hmm. So the economy becomes a thing and the purpose of the economy is to grow. And why is growth important? Because with the proliferation of financial instruments all based on debt, and debt, of course, requires repayment of the, of the principal plus interest, how are you going to pay that interest if your business isn't growing? Mm. So we have to have growth for that purpose. We have to have growth so that more people will have jobs because by now the population is growing also, you know, now that we have industrial food systems and and new pharmaceuticals, better health care. The population is growing, which is a good thing. We like human beings. We want more mm. of them. But in order to support them, we have to have more jobs. And for more jobs, the economy has to grow. Also, the government is beginning to manage the economy in more and more ways. And how, you know, how can the government afford to do that unless it has, unless it's collecting more tax revenues? And the only way it's going to get more tax revenues is if the economy is growing. Hmm. So all throughout this period, the idea of economic growth as necessary for financial health becomes uh, dominant and in fact commonplace to the point where now questioning economic growth, questioning whether we need economic growth or whether it's a good thing is almost uh, a... uh, you can almost be put in the loony bin. <laughs> it's, yeah. Just, yeah. it's off the charts. It's, it's outside what's called the Overton window of acceptable mm. topics for conversation. So that's, that's a sort of brief overview of, of how we got to this situation where, you know, we, we want more and more, even though, we know in our heart of hearts that we should be satisfied with what we have and that we'll mm. actually be much happier if we are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is, this is kind of an idea taught in philosophy, right? It's this idea that there's two ways to get rich or, or to, to be happy. You, know, you can either get more stuff or mm-hmm. you can be happy with what you have. Right. And I think that one of the reasons why you might see such a backlash against this idea that growth is somewhat limited um, I was speaking with David Rowe Peak, uh, this this um, wonder, wonderful uh, uh, leader who's written this book um, about basically risk perception, and he talks about the fact that human beings are just purely emotional creatures, and one of the reasons why we stack up so many things in our lives is because a thing represents your ability to survive another day effectively, mm-hmm. and to the human species piling up things basically means, Hey, if I have more stuff than you, then I'm a a more efficient human being. I'm going to survive longer than you. Biologically, there's a big basis there for for wanting to stack up more stuff, but, but we need to recognize that it's a product of our nature, not necessarily what's going to make us happy. How do you, how do you get people to see that? Yeah. Maybe you don't need to go into debt to get that next thing. Maybe you don't need to, to keep on buying more stuff. How do you get them to see that when it's so ingrained in us as human beings that we need more stuff in order to be safe in life? Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're really talking about two, um, two drives, two countervailing mm-hmm. drives, one of which is, is the drive for, for status and security, which um, is, is you know, very deep in our biological nature. And that's a drive that makes us want to have more power mm. and more stuff. Um, and, and that's, that's uh, balanced by another drive that's more socially developed uh, that, that often depends upon uh, education. And, and we're talking about 
virtually all human cultures that, that we're aware of, uh, mm. a, a drive that says, look, in order for us to have a cooperative, successful social group, whether it's a tiny hunter-gatherer band or, or a civilization, you know, we all have to cooperate. We have to mod- moderate our desire for power. Uh, we have to not be bullies. We have to uh, look out for each other. We have to moderate our our, our consumption. And um, human nature is is a balancing act between these two things. Mm-hmm. And over time, societies have developed ways of punishing bullies. Uh, it, it, long ago, in you know, hunter gatherer times, going perhaps going back to the you know, the Paleolithic times uh, before, you know, where we have to go into the archaeological record to see evidence. It appears that um, human groups maintain their their civility, their cooperation by systematically mm-hmm. getting rid of bullies. You know, if somebody, if one of the men in the group, and it was always a man for, I'm, I'm sure, biological reasons, uh, if one of the, one of the men in the group started to you know uh, get his way all the time and assert himself and uh, in a way that was detrimental to everyone else in, in the group, everybody else would just kind of get together quietly and uh, and then take him out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, capital yeah. punishment. And over time, this actually had a, a civilizing effect, although civilization it comes much later, a, a moderating effect on human aggressive, aggression and aggressiveness. Um, and and we, we developed this countervailing, you know, cultural uh, drive toward civility, toward mm. cooperation, toward uh, self-moderation. But, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing battle. And what's happened over the last century, as we were talking about earlier, with fossil fuels, uh, economic growth, and consumerism has tilted the scales in a way that's, that's profoundly unsettling for our, our future and fate as, as, as a species. Because mm-hmm. unless we get this back under control, unless we rebalance those scales and do so pretty quickly and effectively, we'll just consume ourselves to extinction. And mm. one of the effects, of course, of that consumption is waste, the production of waste. And one of those wastes is carbon dioxide going to the atmosphere, uh, causing uh, climate change. But that's not the only, uh, that's not the only limiting factor to our, our continued growth, but it's one that a lot of us are starting to pay attention to. Mm. Yeah, you know, you know, I, I, I wanted to touch on kind of two elements in this interview. I really want to, I, I want to continue this discussion with you around the idea of of the limited growth that we're under, but also I did want to talk about that documentary. So we might as well jump into that now as well, seeing sure. as you brought it up. Um, now, being as objective as possible, obviously you weren't the uh, the executive producer of the documentary, but Definitely um, <laughs> you're involved in it. So, you know, I wanted to give you the opportunity because there's a lot of differing opinions. What do you think that they got really right in the documentary? What do you think can come down to maybe a little bit of sensa- sensationalism? Yeah. Well, I think what they got right was a, uh, a, a critique of the environmental movement and especially the environmental movement in the United States. Mm. That's long overdue. Um, they were effectively saying that environmentalists have put too much faith in um, the techno fix. You know, if we mm. if we just invest a bunch of money in solar panels and wind turbines, then everything will be fine. We can essentially continue living more or less as we are now, but with a, a, a clean climate conscience, right? And I think that was that was a bubble that need needed to be burst mm. uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the 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 idea of renewable energy as uh, as a, an environmental fix uh, takes the our attention away from overpopulation and overconsumption, which mm. the er- early phases of the environmental movement really focused on. And rightly so, I believe. 
uh, overpopulation and overconsumption are still root problems that we have to deal with. But a lot of environmentalists just don't talk about them anymore. The other problem with the, the techno fix is that it's not really being sold with a um, with realism. Uh, mm. Renewable energy can't just seamlessly replace fossil fuels uh, so that we continue living as, as we currently do. And I say this having spent about a year working with uh, uh, David Fridley, who's a staff scientist at the Energy Analysis Program at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He's a guy who really understands energy in a very technical level. And we, as I say, we spent months looking at the, the possibilities, the prices, the, 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 the technical ways of measuring different energy sources. And it's, it's a complex subject. Energy analysis is, um, is complicated, okay? And, uh, and, and so we, we looked at uh, uh, the, the problems with renewable energy, uh, having to do with intermittency, the fact that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't mm. always blow. How do you deal with inter intermittency? Well, with energy storage, with capacity redundancy, with, with demand management, those are the three basic ways. Each of those has costs associated with it. Then we looked at the fact that uh, renewable energy produces electricity directly, which in some ways is a very good thing because electricity is very high quality energy. And ordinarily we have to pr produce electricity by burning fossil fuels, which is very inefficient. We lose about 60% mm. of the energy in the process. So all of that's very good. But the problem is we only use about 20% of our energy globally in the form of electricity. The other 80% mm. is in transportation, agriculture, industrial processes, building, heating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So adapting electricity to meet those needs or adapting those technologies to use electricity is going to be very costly and require a lot of industrial infrastructure. So at the end of the day, you know, when we had balanced all of those things out, we could not figure out a realistic pathway to get to, you know, switching out our current energy usage levels to renewables we could, what we could do was figure out a way of reducing our overall energy consumption pretty dramatically in the wealthy industrialized countries like the United States, maybe by 80, 90 percent. Mm. And then if, we, if you do that, then you can supply that remaining 10 or 20 percent of energy using renewables that are uh, solar and wind backed up by um, hydropower uh, uh, geothermal power, uh, possibly some other forms of uh, base load electricity production, so that the intermittency isn't as big of a problem, isn't as costly to balance out, and and you can you can have some kind of system, some kind of workable grid that way. Mm. Of course, nobody wants to hear that because what they want is is a, a current energy supply and more so that we can build out, you know, 5G uh, communications networks that use even more electricity and, and basically support economic growth. Yeah. So our, our, our study, which we wrote up as a book, Our Renewable Future, it's available for free on the internet. It got very little notice and compared to the, the, the film that we've been talking about, um, the Planet of the Humans, which got enormous uh, press, lots of eyeballs looking at it. Why? Mm. Because it was controversial. It was mm. it was in your face. It uh, it it was defamatory, actually, towards some of the environmentalists who were talked about, like uh, Bill McKibben of 350.org. I thought the the film was really took some cheap shots at some very good people. And I was very sad to see that. Hmm. But on the other hand, what that did was raise a huge controversy and resulted in, you know, six, eight million people looking at the film. Whereas our, hmm. our book, which was much more technical, you know, I, I can really stand behind the kinds of analysis that we did. Uh, I don't I don't know exactly how many people have read it, but it's a it's a very, very small fraction of that. Hmm. Well, this this is a good direction to go because. 
Something that I've been feeling lately is I think that you can boil down so many of the problems that we see uh, in the world today to the fact that there's, it's almost as if people are playing on teams now. They're not interested in ideas. They're interested in their team. So they'll be out there waving their placards all day for their team. Um, But meanwhile, the players of their team are away, you know, in some ways, like the documentary might have suggested, making the problem even worse. But nobody suspects that because, hey, I'm on your team and I will just back up everything you do. So you might put out a book like that and, and, and hey, here, here's some great ideas. Here's some great information that could be helpful. People might not be interested because they're not interested in ideas. They're interested in their team winning. Exactly. And that's why a controversial documentary gets so much, uh, so much, you know, publicity because, because it's something that either goes against or for a team. And you know, this, I think that, I think you're so right. This is a bubble that really needs to be burst. People need to be looking for these ideas. And you, you said something really interesting recently, which I want to touch on. Actually, I don't even know if it was recently. I can't remember when the, the video was from, but you, you talked about our need to bring economies to like a local level to have an, almost a self-reliance. And I think that what we see at the moment in the world, I've been watching a lot of videos with, you know, various political leaders talking about the need for them to bring their nation's assets back home. And, you know, like, let's, let's focus on our individual communities, our countries first. Do you think that there's almost going to be a shift in globalization back to a more uh, community orientated view of the world after this, this whole pandemic blows over? Uh, yes, and it's it's happening uh, mm. quite rapidly, and part of it is um, is being driven by uh, the collapse in supply chains that has occurred. Uh, shipping globally mm. is way down. Uh, of course, the airline industry is is on life support. Uh, to use an unfortunate metaphor. Mm. Um, and as a result of these, and there's, and there's a great deal of suspicion among certain important countries like the United States and, and China are regarding each other very suspiciously. Did, did, uh, did, did a laboratory in Wuhan uh, inadvertently release the virus? Uh, you, you know, uh, China is supposedly now um, uh, surveilling and, and trying to steal s- secrets from labs in the U.S. that are working on vaccines, all of these th- things going on. So the, 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 the result of all of this is that uh, there is uh, more and more uh, uh, stress in the fabric of, of globalization itself. The fabric is starting to tear. Then within countries, certain countries more than others, I would, I would say the United States primarily, where you have a um, an ineffectual or incompetent central government, regions are starting to break off because they're not seeing effective leadership at, at the top. Here in the United States, uh, state governments uh, were not able to rely on the federal government to procure uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, or uh, ventilators, or any of the other necessary uh, materials and machines that they needed to mm. fight the virus locally, so they were they were left to their own resort. Um, I think what we're seeing in the U.S. is potentially the breakdown of the federal system, and I would not be too surprised to see over the course of the next several months some pretty dramatic political events that that result in uh, a, a greater localization of, uh, of political control and economic activity. Unfortunately, in the U.S., I think it's going to be a pretty violent process, and I, mm. I shudder to think what, what that may mean. That said, um, you know, the trend away from globalization is one that sh- we should have foreseen a long time ago, and I've been talking about this for a couple of decades now, it's been based on cheap fossil globalization has been based on cheap fossil fuels without cheap fossil fuels for uh, international trade and travel and for international communications 
without a, a global financial system that's backed up by uh, global communication, globalization could not have occurred. And it, it's mm. a trend that has seen its time come and go. In, we've seen uh, cycles throughout history of increasing global integration, like the buildup of the Roman Empire. And then those cycles naturally come to an end, and there's a, a release of that kind of complexity back to a, a smaller scale, more localized way of organization. Mm. And I, all of the signs are that we have, we have reached the culmination of that, that global cycle of uh, integration uh, represented by globalization and that, that we're passing into a new phase. It's mm. going to, I think it's going to be fairly chaotic, at least it's in, in many ways, but it's something we could have easily foreseen. And there are ways mm. of managing the unraveling, if you will, that would minimize you know, human suffering and, uh, and the loss mm. of, of knowledge. This is one of the things that I'm, I'm most concerned about. You know, we've spent the last number of decades building up human knowledge in many areas. You know, we, we figured out the human genome. We built the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we figured out biological evolution to a very large degree, not entirely, but we've made uh, big strides on and on and on. And um, if we lose electricity grids, for example, all of that would, would, would disappear very quickly but mm. because it's all stored on computer hard drives. Uh, that's why I, I'm in favor of developing renewable energy as much as we can so that we can maintain uh, an electrical grid infrastructure as a, as a transitional strategy toward whatever's in the future. If the transition is abrupt and, and civilization collapses uh, entirely and quickly, then I think we're in for not only a humanitarian tragedy, but also a culture, cultural tragedy that could be prevented. Mm. Yeah, Richard, you know, I, I think um, th- there's a really interesting discussion to have here because, you know, you listen to what you're saying and, um, you know, you're talking about... <sighs> even going back into the earlier conversation, how the human uh, human condition is that we like to get rid of bullies. And that's yeah. been since the start of time. And then, um, you know, you think about uh, ancient stories and uh, philosophers who have warned us against this sort of stuff uh, through telling us repeated cycles of humanity. This is just how humanity goes. We, you know, we build up and then all of a sudden we fall and then we build up and we fall. And um, yeah. I, I posted a quote from um, a, a philosopher from ancient Greece recently. I can't remember what his name is, but he said, a state is doomed to fail when they can no longer tell a good man from bad. Yeah. And, you know, when you start to draw some connections, um, I think of the words of Seneca, the philosopher. He said uh, that the element of surprise always makes a calamity so much worse. And so you actually need to foresee things coming so that it's not a surprise to you and you can, you can act virtuously and try to help as many people to get through it as possible. Right. When I'm talking with you about all this sort of stuff, it's hard not to start to think revolution. You know, it's just, are we on the verge of some sort of catastrophic human event? Where nobody can really jump in and stop it other than to just say, listen, as many people as possible, just act calm and try not to make this worse than what it needs to be. I don't want to spread fear around that. I don't want to spread rumors that that's going to happen. What I am interested in is getting people to think about the very real consequences of not being vigilant in a time like this, when there are so many moving parts. So I think that it's helpful to have that conversation. Do you think that, you know, without fear mongering, which is not what I want here, do you think that we're on the edge of some sort of, um, you know, really tense moment in history where things could go south very quickly like that? Uh, yeah, the question is how how quickly. Um, mm. Over the course of this century, we are almost certainly going to see um, a, a very significant simplification of a lot of systems that we've, we've built up over the course of the last hundred years using the cheap energy of fossil fuels. Our food system will have to go back to a more, more local uh, basis. Uh, we won't be able to support, you know, huge financial systems based on ephemeral claims on, 
on future wealth. Um, so the question is how that simplification occurs and how, mm. how suddenly and how controllably it occurs. And I'm in touch with uh, several networks of scholars who have been thinking about this for some time and, uh, and looking for ways to, to alert the authorities, if, mm. you know, so that, so that steps can be taken at the policy level to make this as painless a trans, transition as, as possible. So far, we haven't had much luck in getting the ear of, of the folks in charge. It's a message they, they would prefer to just tune out. There are some in the military uh, in the U.S. who are certainly aware of all of the things that we've been talking about and, and, uh, and you know, very privately are, are making sort of plans to, to deal with these sorts of things. But, of course, that's from the perspective of the military which mm -hmm. is a very different perspective from somebody who ha is able to make policy in say the food system or the, the, the healthcare system or, or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit discouraging. So from that standpoint, I could say, you know, maybe a, maybe a more chaotic adaptation is, is more likely. But on the other hand, you know, we have seen with the coronavirus pandemic, the speed at which people are able to adapt if given uh, the right messages. Mm. So social distancing, wearing face masks, um, you know, there are all sorts of pretty dramatic adaptations that people have undertaken. Um, and in a very, in, it, for the most part, a very pro-social attitude. And I, th I think we can, we can take some, you know, um, uh, derive some optimism from mm. from that, so that you know, just to assume that because we're we're headed into a, a, a pretty a deep and scary transformation, that therefore this means we're all going to be at each other's throats and and you know stealing each other's canned food at gunpoint and and so on. You know, not necessarily. That's mm. I'm sure that's going to happen in many instances. But that's not all that the future holds, even in the worst case, I'm sure. Mm. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a, a really important point there. And, and, you know, like I said, I think it's just good to, it's good to keep your wits about you in a time like this and just to, to be healthily cautious, you know, not scared, just cautious so that you at least know that you're going to act correctly, hopefully, and be objective as possible. But you bring up an interesting point there, and I'm so glad that, there are people out there who are focusing on these issues and trying to alert the authorities. Yeah. But at the same time, like you say, it's, it, you know, it's, it's almost like trying to tell a poison salesman that the poison's killing all these people and you shouldn't be selling it. He knows it's poison. He knows it's killing all these people still hasn't gotten out of the business, you know, like his, pay, his paycheck de depends on it. Yeah. It's, it's a game of in incentives, right? And just the same as every time the government incentivizes anything, you're going to have crooks in there, just like we've seen, you know, in that documentary with the, with the fossil fuel industry. There's, there's, you know, as soon as you put a, a reward up for something, people are going, like, I, I think of these great stories of when governments um, incentivize the, um, the killing of an infestive species, um, and all of a sudden they find that people are actually breeding this species so that they can show it to the government and say, Hey, we've killed these, <laughs> you know, and that's been, that's happened multiple times in the past. And, um, you know, I think that I wanted to touch on something that you said a, a few years back, you had a couple of quotes here that really spoke to me because in, and, and, you know, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I'm always going to come at you with philosophical questions. <laughs> but um, this, the Stoics talk about, this idea of living in agreement with nature. And that means many things. It means living in agreement with what it means to be a human as, as our human nature, universal nature, and also your individual nature. One of the things that that also means is, listen, nature, you know, we come from nature and we go back to nature. It gives us everything that we need, right? Um, if you're willing to be satisfied with what nature gives you, that's one interpretation. And you said a couple of things that were so in line with that. And I want you to elaborate on it. You said, 
uh, nature is not a subset of the economy, but the economy is a subset of nature. So we tend to separate uh, separate ourselves from nature, which is just, it's impossible. And so, yeah, we keep on burning trees and logging forests and because it's a part of the economy, but it's horrifying. Um, and you also said something that really uh, spoke to me. You said, there will be a moment when we learn to live within Earth's limits. I... I, I love that line because it really does add to philosophy. It adds to our understanding and says, listen, okay, yeah, Earth has its limits and we're currently pushing them and we're seeing a lot of push back, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether it is the virus, whether it is global warming and, and fires in Australia and cyclones and all this crazy stuff that's happening, there is going to be a shift. What I'm wondering, I guess the core question is, if you think back to when the world was uh, deriving its energy from say whale blubber, right. And there was a big scare over, Oh my gosh, we're running out of whales. What are we going to do? Um, everybody's panicking. And then all of a sudden they find a new energy source. And that was I the tend- solution. solution. That's it. To our problem. Yeah. But I, I tend to think, you know, we're going to come up with that solution. I just think that it's a matter of, time and it's not going to happen until there is literally no money to be made in fossil fuels you know (laughs) like they're going to drain the earth of their fossil fuels because there's still money in it do you think we can move on before the economic incentive is gone well if we're going to we'd better hurry up because (laughs) time is running out fast i mean the oil industry is just in tatters right now um, you know, basically for the last 10, we, we, we used up all the cheap oil, mm. uh, before about 2005. And so oil was getting more and more expensive in 2007. We had this, uh, price run up in, in, uh, for, for global oil. And that was one of the contributors of, to the, uh, the, the great recession of 2008. Actually, it, it reached a peak of 100 and almost $150 a barrel in, in the middle of 2008. And that was part of the trigger uh, for, the, for the crisis. And so what happened? That incentivized then the extraction of lower quality, more expensive to produce oil, like the tar sands in Canada, like the uh, tight oil in the U.S. Uh, produced from hydrofracturing and horizontal drilling. And for the next 10 years, a a significant amount of new supply came on from these high cost sources. The companies that were specializing in these new sources weren't weren't making any money. I mean, with rare exceptions, they they were spending more money in drilling than they were making in sales Mm. of product. But it was the next big thing, and all, a huge amount of money had been injected into the financial system in order to solve the Great Recession. So that money was finding its way to the frackers because, after all, they needed to invest it somewhere, and he were, here were these people who had this miraculous new technology and, and lots of oil wells and so on. Uh, now, with the coronavirus pandemic, the demand for oil has fallen off dramatically. And so oil prices have fallen. A, a couple of weeks ago, they were actually in negative territory. The, mm. the, the barrel of oil was selling for negative $37 a barrel. <laughs> How is that yeah. even possible? You know, yeah. it's crazy. So all of the oil companies are suffering. Exxon Mobil, which invested heavily in, in fracking over the last few years, is is now in very very bad shape, and the hundreds of smaller companies that have that only produce uh, the uh, high cost um, tight oil and tar sands are they're just they're toast, mm. and there's no, no there's no coming back. Um, uh, so the you know if if we were going to make a uh, a, a, a systemic graduated, rational, controlled uh, move away from our dependence on oil, Mm. we missed the opportunity. Uh, From here on out, it's going to be very chaotic. The oil industry is going to be collapsing in fits and starts, and and we don't have something to to replace it. You know, uh, we have a few 
electric cars. But there's no incentive for anyone to buy electric cars because oil is so cheap. But because oil is so cheap, the oil industry is cratering. And mm. if the oil industry tries to recover, if it gets bailed out by the government, that sends oil prices higher and the whole thing just starts over again. It's complete, completely dysfunctional. And, mm. um, and we missed our chance, basically. Yeah. Painting a pretty gloom picture, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Listen, we'll, we'll try to leave somebody with, with, with some positives from here. But um, no, it's, I think it's so important. What, what, what you're saying there, it's, um, it's so heavy and it's so beyond my comprehension. Yeah. You know, which... well, I think you know, that's why it's important, I think, to bring this back to what, what we can do as individuals. Exactly. You yeah. know, we, can, we can grow a garden. We can, mm. we can learn to get by with less. We can repair stuff rather than throwing it away and, and buying new stuff. We can get to know our neighbors and start sharing more with our neighbors because what, that, that, what does that do? It creates trust. Mm. And your neighbors are going to be really, really important to your survival. We learned this uh, here where I live in California over the last few years. We've had a series of devastating wildfires. And when a wildfire comes, uh, you know, who do we look to? We look to our neighbors mm. to help us get out in time or to warn us that, uh, that a fire is coming. Uh, you know, and, and so building up that, that, that familiarity and trust with the people around us, that's way more important than going after, you know, an, another increment of financial welfare or something, you know, um, making another thousand bucks, you know, mm. it's that thousand bucks pales in compor- in comparison to the value of having one more trusted neighbor. Mm. Uh, so if we start thinking that way and acting that way, you know, we'll be, we'll be able to get through this and in fact, have a better experience of life in the process. Life is more enjoyable if you're sharing it with people you trust. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think, I I think um, that that's exactly where I wanted to take this is, is what can we do individually? And this is where I think that, um, you know, the, the arguments of stoicism actually come into play because they, they suggest that, Hey, you know, you focus on yourself and you focus on making yourself the strongest version of yourself that you can be. Then you, you help your family, then you help your community, then you help your country, then you help but there seems to be this kind of top down approach now. And when you start to think about these issues um, from the top down approach, it's you immediately go into a nihilistic space because it's, it's impossible (laughs) for you to change everything that's happening up there. But uh, I'd like to know, you know, I, I agree, get to know your neighbor, start um, curbing your desires a little bit so that you live a simpler life. Cause um, you can probably talk about this as well, that every single thing that you buy has some sort of footprint. Like it's, you know, like the, the amount of energy that has gone into creating that, even right. just the fact that you were talking about how cheap fuel is compared to how much money is spent or how much time and man hours is spent putting it together for you. And you can drive a hundred kilometers or whatever for, you know, two, three, five bucks, whatever. And it, that's unbelievable. But I guess, one question that I had, is there anything that individuals in the society can do that is not a, not, that is not a violent act that they can do to get through to the politicians? Like, I, I don't, and I know it changes in every country, but like, who do you write to? Where do you go? Like, what's, is there anything that we can do to spread that message to people who are, who are important in, in making it, uh, making it known? <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish I had a, a a simple answer to that that question, but I think I think we have to begin to make a a a kind of uh, constituency mm. for what what we're talking about. I mean, there already are organizations who are promoting um, simpler life. I mean, there there's permaculture in Australia. You have the one of the originators of, of permaculture, David Holmgren very, very important thinker. You have the Simplicity Institute with Samuel Alexander and uh, Ted Trainer has been doing great work for for many years in Australia on uh, uh, creating simpler way of life. And these these people are are trying to get through to 
uh, to the, 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 the civil authorities, but also the cultural authorities, you know, the people mm-hmm. who, who, uh, who decide what matters enough to talk about in the news media and, and so on. Mm-hmm. So supporting these people and spreading their message is, is something really, really helpful uh, rather than trying to sort of invent something entirely from scratch. Mm. So there, there, there are starting points, but there's, there's no, I, I, I wish I could say, you know, do this and, and immediately the prime minister is going to pay attention <laughs> and change his mind. Yeah. Well, like, like we say, you know, it's, it's a problem of incentives and, and, and until people are incentivized to act correctly and to move in a better direction. But, um, you know, I, th- I think that that's, that's an important point you make. It's, it's almost as if your attention and your dollar is a vote in the direction that you want to go. Um, and we just have to spend our money wisely and we have to, you know, pay attention to, to the places that we want to be seen in society. But something that I just wanted to touch on as well, I'll probably just ask a couple more questions. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, this, this idea of debt, it actually, um, when you talk about debt, and the purposes for why it was created. I know we talked about this a little bit before, but I want to go a little bit deeper if that's okay. It, this idea that debt and marketing and this consumer economy is literally based around the idea that we will always want more. We will always desire to have more stuff and get more stuff. And, um, you know, I even think about uh, the quote from back in the sixties, I can't exactly remember who it was from, but during the psychedelic era, it was like that quote of, you know, these people who take the psychedelics, they're not going to fight your wars. They're not going to buy your products, that sort of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and you can clearly see why that might've been one of the motivations between getting rid of a lot of that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> clearly. Um, but I think that a lot of, a lot more people are waking up now. A lot more people are actually waking up to the fact that a, getting more stuff isn't going to make you happy. Um, And B uh, it's actually ruining the planet and it's ruining. um, It it actually ruins your happiness. If you think about it, because you're constantly chasing after something that is fake. Um, But, but I think that there's an important discussion to have here because, you know, when I watch advertisements, when I watch TV shows, when I watch the general culture of America and all around the world, people are involved in American culture because they've been very good at sending their culture around the world. Um, but when I watch these things, I'm like, man, they are spending just millions and millions of dollars on making these advertisements so perfect to get you to feel a certain way so that you buy a certain thing. You know, on every corner in America, you've got some sort of loan agency, uh, quick loans, you know, like whatever, you know, low interest rates, high interest rates, whatever. But the economy is based around this idea that people are always going to want more. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is the core, the the core solution here to get more and more people to say, no, I'm not going to get involved in the consumer economy because that's not actually what brings me happiness. And if so, how do you think we get back to that? Do you think it's going back to more kind of not saying get back to organized religion, but getting back to that community element of religion, which is, you know, Hey, desire less and get involved in your community. Long winded question, but I'm going to hand it over to you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically what we're talking about is, is getting away from the market economy back toward the gift economy. Mm. I mean, the gift economy was, was original when we lived as hunter gatherers for tens of thousands of years, we basically just shared everything that was available within the community. Um, There was no thought of somebody hoarding uh, wealth or supplies or, or, so there was basically no economic inequality. I mean, if if anybody was starving, it was because the whole tribe was starving. Mm. Um, then gradually over time, uh, markets developed. There, there was trade at first, but trade was looked upon as something really dangerous because your interests and the interests of the person you were trading with were at odds. You know, each of you was trying to get a better deal. So the only people you ever traded with were people in a different tribe. Mm. Right? Because you, it was to, to allow that competition 
and that level of distrust to to get seeded and grow within your own social group would be very detrimental. So trade would is something w- that would never happen within the society. It was always something that happened between societies. Then as we developed agriculture and started living in, in larger and larger towns and then cities, trade took root within the community itself. And we became more and more strangers to each other, both mm-hmm. because there were so many people living together, but also because the, our relationships were more and more relationships of exchange rather than simply sharing. So that lowered levels of trust, increased levels of, of alienation and suspicion and so on. And all of human history can be seen as the, the progressive uh, shrinkage of the sharing economy and the progressive uh, growth of the market economy. And of course, that's happened especially over the last century with the growth of the economy itself as a result of all the things we were talking about earlier, fossil fuels, debt, and so on. And so now we find ourselves at the end of this process where we're very much alienated from the people around us and 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 we're distrustful of our leaders and the direction of society. It's, it's, it's a pretty sad state of affairs. And getting back to a situation where we, we really do feel at home with, with ourselves, the people around us, and, and the society that we're a part of is going to require um, less and less trade, less and less markets, more and more sharing and, um, and uh, you know, the sharing economy is still with us. It's not mm. that it went away altogether. The sharing economy still exists within families, within churches, within nonprofit organizations, and, and so on. It's just a matter of making that more and more the focus of our lives and our, our attention and taking our attention away from everything that's bought and sold and, you know, has a price tag on it and, uh, and and enta- entails the sale of our own labor. You know, our, mm-hmm. our the hours of our lives get measured and sold just like any other commodity. And how mm-hmm. alienating is that? So finding finding ways around workarounds to the to the market economy and finding subversive little paths back into the gift economy is really what it's all about. And every time we do that, we get satisfaction. Because the mm. market economy, the only satisfaction the market economy can give us is the satisfaction of consumption or sometimes a, a satisfaction of security in that we have, as you were saying, saying at the beginning, this pile of stuff that we've built up. Mm. But the satisfaction of the, of the sharing economy is much, much deeper. It goes right to the core of our being because it's the, it's the feeling of, of trust in the people around us. It's the, it's the, it's that uh, that sense of security that reaches deep back into our Paleolithic uh, memory. As, yeah. As humans. Hmm. Yeah. No. Brilliant. And and now that you've you know listening to you there, you've you've made me think of a couple of more questions. So I'm going to ask these quickly. <laughs> but okay. uh, you know, I, I, you may have already answered them in there. Um, but when we have this correction what do you think are going to be the the skills, the attributes, the characteristics of say an individual or a company who actually fares well after this, Mm -hmm. after this correction happens? So yeah. What, what should we do to to prepare ourselves to be, to, to thrive in adversity? Yeah. Well, learn to be self-sufficient. We've talked about that, but also learn to be helpful, Mm. Uh, genuinely helpful to other people. And if, if, if you, if you put your effort into that, then other people are going to help you, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's simplistic, but it is philosophical. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and, you know, that's why I love this. I love talking with you and I want to have you back many more times as well. Cause I think that you can, the arguments that you're discussing, they touch on economics, they touch on the environment, they have elements of philosophy in there. There's, it really spans so many issues. Um, and I wanted to ask you, this, this would probably be my last question for you. Uh, 
you obviously pay attention to people when you're talking to them. You pay attention to how they respond to your various arguments. What do you think is the the best argument that you put forward that garners the most respect or, or maybe changes the most minds? Like what's the most effective argument that you ever put across? Oh boy, that's a really tough one. Um, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't have one, that's fine. Cause I I'm have a little bit at a loss this, because yeah. uh, <laughs> sometimes I pay a lot more attention to what, you know, what isn't working, <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, I, I think, um, what we've just been talking about, the happiness factor, you know, what we should be doing is, rather than measuring GDP is measuring gross national happiness. When we start yeah. thinking in those terms, in terms of what, what's to be gained by changing our behavior, by changing what we're striving for and, and measuring, um, you know, I, I, I think people are, are naturally responsive to that. It, it puts us in a, in a good mood for, uh, for making the effort required. Whereas if we just look at the scary stuff, it, um, I think it can short circuit people's, um, effectiveness. You know, mm. we, we, we tune out and I, I'm scared to see that with young people actually, that they, mm. they, they see the trends with climate change and, and, and so on. And they don't see their leaders doing anything about those trends so it makes them passive and um, and sort of blank. You know, it take, makes them turn in on themselves. So they're just staring at their little screen all day, mm. rather than thinking about what they can do. So I think I think it's really important to talk about what what there is to be gained and enjoyed and shared in turning our attention back to to what really matters. Mm. You know, Richard, I think. That is such a great place to end this because, you know, I do tend to focus a little bit more on the side of what's the chaos coming. And I think that's because I'm in that mindset at the moment sure. of, you know, you need to prepare yourself. Absolutely. But you know what? There's also room for turning that around and saying, listen, why don't we focus less on what's to be lost? Why don't we focus more on what's to be gained from this kind of transition? And I think you're exactly right. That sense of community, that sense of self-reliance, that, uh, you know, the, the true happiness that comes from living a simpler lifestyle, which many people will be forced into. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be a good process. I'm not saying it's going to be um, uh, fun for everybody. And I'm not saying that I think I would like to see this happen. But <laughs> what I am saying is for those who adapt themselves, I think that they're going to see some real positives in, in the way that they navigate life if they they take this advice and they start to downsize their lifestyle a little bit but yeah. richard this has been a really enlightened conversation I'm, I'm so grateful for you coming on and giving of your time i know that you're, bu you're a busy man but thank you and uh you know i'd love to have you back in the future well, it's been a pleasure simon i really enjoyed talking with you and i, I look forward to more Okay, so there you have it, my interview with Richard Heinberg. I'm sure you guys enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed having that conversation. Such a fascinating guy and so much to think about, um, which is really the goal of this podcast is to get you guys to think a little bit deeper about certain situations in life, uh, about global issues that we're dealing with, and also about how you can bring that back to a personal level in your own life. Uh, but Seriously, love this guy. You got to go out there, check out his books. The links are in the show notes and I'll talk to you guys next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.